So it's great to have with us today Peter Dunn. Peter should be known to many of us because he spoke not so long ago at one of our NBA assemblies when he was working for the MS World Mission. But uh, now Peter's changed role and he is uh, the European Director of Big Life Ministries. And Big Life is a disciple making movement. So first of all, Peter, I guess uh, the question is to tell us a bit about Big Life. What is it? How does it operate? And what's happening in the UK in particular? Yeah, well, I've um been with Big Life for a year, but actually related to them very closely for about 10 years in my previous role with BMS. So they're what some people term a disciple making movement based in Asia. And I think today a lot of people would say, where is the church booming and growing and how do we learn from them? And so the house church in China that's grown dramatically and the church uh, in some parts of India as well, seeing explosive growth. And A few years ago, these movements would have been called church planting movements, but they changed the terminology to disciple making movements, saying that actually if we make disciples, then the byproduct of that is we will see churches, um, new churches form. And so I suppose for 10 years, I sort of engaged with this in Asia and began to think, is this just an Asian thing or is there more to it? And for me, I've come to see that it's actually a deeply biblical thing. It's going back to the principles of Jesus and the early church and saying, how did that early church go about making disciples who make disciples and have such an impact really in one lifetime? And if you take it on 300 years, you know that so many people coming to know Christ and we're seeing a similar sort of movement drawing from those biblical roots. Um, And so my role then came along saying, okay, if this is a biblical thing, how does it connect in with the church in Europe? And that's my role to try and contextualize it. So not simply to say, let's just graft something from one place and drop it in somewhere else, but how do we fit it into the context of the United Kingdom and of Europe, which has a a deep Christian history, but how do we rediscover some of that, uh, those basic principles about how we make disciples who make disciples. And so I partly have, we have, we have a partnership agreement with the Yorkshire Baptists, um, a bit further south, you would call them southerners, I suppose. Um, but we've been deliberately working, focusing with them as if you like our Jerusalem, you know, when when the, when Jesus promised the spirit, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth, we would be witnesses. And so Yorkshire's become a bit like my Jerusalem, if you like. So really working closely with YBA, trying to work out in a number of church settings, how do we put these principles into practice? And it's been exciting. We're only a year into it, but already exciting seeing some of the early signs of growth uh, within churches and people coming to faith in Christ. Yeah, thank you. And, and uh, from what I've uh, picked up from, from certainly Asia uh, and, and a little bit in the UK, that, that uh, um, what Big Life is a, able to do is it, it's very intentional about um, evangelism, sharing faith and, and also replicating that. So discipling people straight away who can then share faith. And so there's that potential for exponential growth, which we, we know in theory, but we, we very, very rarely see in practice in the church. But it, it does seem to be happening, certainly in, 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 in Asia, doesn't it? And uh, yeah. um, in terms of what you see going on in the UK in these early days, um, maybe you could tell a story of, that, that would just indicate uh, how big life is helping uh, in a UK context, what God is doing through it. Yeah, I'll t- talk about one church in East Yorkshire in a place called Beverly, um, where... Um, Basically, it, it all comes out of relationship. And I think one of the challenges can be that we have been through generations in or uh, in my lifetime in church life. Often we we just take programs and we think, oh, I'll take this program, put it in and plug it in and away we'll go. Whereas actually what we say is we're not about program, we're about relationship. And so um, through a friendship with a, some with one of the leaders in that church, um, uh, we've developed a yeah, a, a friendship where then I was invited to speak to their leadership team and share something of the vision of disciple making. And then, uh, but what I said to folk was, for me, this isn't a quick fix. And I think when Jesus calls disciples to follow him, he says, you know, take up a cross and follow me. There's a costly side to discipleship. And perhaps there's a danger in our consumerist society. We're looking for something that's comfortable and a quick fix. But this is actually a costly thing. Like you were saying earlier, Paul, you know, it's about sharing our faith which actually can be quite a hurdle to get over so a smaller group then met with me from Beverly for about five or six weeks where we unpack going back to the the gospels again and to the book of acts and saying how did the early church go about this disciple making this bold proclamation of faith like we see with Peter on the day of Pentecost this guy who 
denied Christ not that many days before, suddenly stands up in front of a crowd of thousands and proclaims Christ. So there's something about a bold proclamation of Christ. And what I was finding, not just in Beverly, but in other places, was actually we've lost a bit of our confidence in the gospel and in, I suppose, also in a sense of an expectation that people will be interested or respond to the gospel. Um, and so it was we've been really training people with simple tools about how to share their story of faith and how to share the gospel in simple ways. And then we were sharing around um, tools that, about making disciples, because Jesus came to seek and save the lost, you know, so to bring people far from God into that relationship with him. But if, you, if that's all you do, then people who are lost will get lost again. You have to make them disciples. And so with the Great Commission, they go and make disciples, make people followers of Jesus. And so we've, again, just been training with some simple tools around how do you get people from that journey to coming to faith, but also then growing in faith. And so from that one group, we began to see people stepping out themselves in faith, sharing their faith and um, with it. I mean, it rather, I mean, it goes again shows my lack of faith within one week one couple in the group had led someone to faith in christ in their household so there was a very instantaneous result which was very exciting for the group but to be honest it, it, it is a slow process i think you know it, it invariably it seems to me that people take a time because you're asking them to totally reorientate their lives and so um but also we saw groups then people catching this vision for discipleship and then meeting with other people so there are now probably you know quite a number of groups maybe 10 to 12 groups in Beverly that have spun off from that so the emphasis on dispersion rather than let's not just add people to our group but how do we start new groups that will start new groups and multiply out the way so Beverly Baptist Church is one example of where we're again I, I, I want to be on you know honest we're at the beginnings of this but just seeing some encouraging signs of growth. Thank you um we're talking about disciple making and, and um, I guess we can often in the church assume we understand what we mean when we use the word disciple. Uh, would you like to just explain a bit more what you understand a disciple of Jesus is uh, when you're talking about those who are our disciples who, who make other disciples? Yeah, sure. And I think that's a, a really good question because for me, again, I'm not saying everywhere, but I think there's a danger in our culture that we can become consumers of church as we're consumers of other things in life and actually for me discipleship is is not simply about what I get but what I give and so sometimes our emphasis has been on learning so just um, in the west so we acquire knowledge we do a program we fill our minds with more and more knowledge but the model that I see in Jesus is one of obedience, of actually putting things into practice. There's just that you know, beautiful story you know, that Jesus tells at the end of the Sermon on the Mount about the wise builder. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man. So it's that putting God's word into practice. And that's where I'm really excited to see people actually you know within our discipleship tool we're always when we read we're centered on god's word but when we after reading god's word we then say let's listen to god and say what is he calling us to do as a result of what we've read so not just simply that was a good study i've got more information but how is my life going to be changed because of that and so for me discipleship is about is about learning yes but it's about putting things into practice and lastly, it's about sharing what we have learned. So it's not just a, an introspective thing, but as I have learned something, then even this evening, as from what I was learning today from God's word, I, as, we, as I had dinner with my wife, I said, hey, I've been learning this today and I'm sharing it with Jane. So again, it, it's multiplying out the way all the time, not just keeping it to myself, not a self-centered journey, but one that involves sharing as well. So discipleship is about learning, about obedience, doing what God says and listening to him in that, and then about sharing with other people. Thank you. And we've, we've heard a bit earlier from, from Acts chapter 19, uh, Paul in, in Athens. And, and I wonder what you'd like to tell us from that passage uh, about either being a disciple or making disciples. What, what insights would you like to share with us from that particular passage? Yeah, well, I think for me, it's a passage that, it's, it's funny, it's, you can be familiar with scripture and then suddenly you read it again you think why did I not see this before but just this idea that there was Paul in Ephesus for two years and it says he was discussing daily with people 
um, about faith. But it says at the end of that, it says, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. So Paul never left Ephesus, but we read letters like the letters of the church in Colossae. It doesn't seem very likely at all that Paul ever went there. I think he probably wanted to go, but never got there. But the idea that Paul must have told people in Ephesus, who then maybe had an auntie or a brother or a cousin and went there and told them and told. And so sudden, so the message spreads almost as people, not through Paul running around like the proverbial headless t- chicken, but as he tells people who tell people. So, for example, in our street, we moved here almost exactly a year ago, December last year into Sheffield. Um, but we've started a group with two um, students from India. Um, and through that relationship, they, they're from a Hindu background, we're reading the Bible together, but because we're encouraging them to share faith, we have started a group in Mumbai, in India. We've got another group in Sheffield, which started with school mums, which now has people in Tokyo, in Japan, and Kiev, in Ukraine. But this idea that, you know, I'm not going to <laughs> Mumbai necessarily, or Tokyo, or Kiev, but as we share the stories of scripture and people are sharing them out it goes out and that must be what Paul was doing here so this idea of as we've received freely that good news that Paul went out and he sh- he shared it but he shared it and in in his sharing he was telling other people you've got to go and share it as well that passing on of the good news. Wonderful and, and I guess that's particularly relevant for us at this time when we've gone online we're in lockdown and, and there's it's restricted us in some ways, but it's opened up things in other ways, to, to the potential to uh, relate to people in anywhere in the world. I was just hearing tonight about a, uh, a retreat where, where there were people from the UK, people from Australia who were having to do it in the middle of the night and, and, and people in, in uh, the, the west coast of Canada who were getting up uh, uh, to, uh, to do it. So, so uh, uh, we, we can see the, uh, the message going anywhere, can't we? Yes, yes. Uh, a last thought maybe from you, anything that you've learned from the lockdown about um, being a disciple or making disciples or any, any, any insights about how we can be disciples in this current situation that we're in? Yeah, I think for me, there's something, it's causing a lot of us to sort of ask some fairly fundamental questions about church and, and, and what is church. And I, and I don't pretend to be a great theologian. I have all the answers to that. But It seems even if I go back to this passage in Acts, it says that Paul had discussions daily. There was dialogue that went on. And I think very often we can focus on um, monologue. You know, I can go to church and be quite a passive spectator. And yet, actually, for discipleship for us during this time, what we're finding is that people are we're seeing our groups multiply out the way. There was that June, July in, in Beverly, 12 groups started, you know, group. So we're seeing groups multiply, but people gathering around God's word, putting the Bible at the center of it, but finding how enriching it is as we have dialogue and not monologue, as we share together. I'm not saying there's no place for for people teaching um, others with particular gifts, but I think for me, there is something that we're rediscovering is the richness of simply opening up God's word together in a group. Again, with I'd, like all of us, I'm sure I'd probably be sitting around a table and having that conversation or sitting in a front room. But nevertheless, I think that rediscovery of um, dialogue around God's word has been a really positive thing for me. And, and I find myself learning from people, again, where there's not an expert as such. So for me, with my friends from India, I find that I'm learning from them. They're still on a journey to faith, but actually their insights, I'm not just hearing the insights of one person on a platform but I'm hearing diverse insights into scripture and how God is speaking from our different backgrounds. So that's been the exciting thing for me in lockdown. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, And just to say uh, that that we're hoping to rearrange, we've postponed it, but hoping to rearrange the webinar that Peter's going to lead for us in uh, the NBA uh, for people to find out more about big life and how uh, it can, it can be applicable in your situation. So, so he's in Jerusalem and we're probably just into Judea. (laughs) Uh, just outside Yorkshire. Uh, so it'd be great if, if we can catch up on something of that, that, that movement. That, and I do sense, as I talk to people in the YBA, that there, there's an excitement about big life and what God is doing amongst some of the churches in Yorkshire. Uh, and and uh, I think we'd be foolish in the NBA just to ignore that. Uh, I really want to encourage us to, uh, to, to hear the stories about what's going on in Yorkshire, to hear what Peter has to say, uh, to, to, to just sense, is God in this 
for us in, in some of our NBA churches? Can big life uh, influence or, or maybe even be a, a real catalyst in a big way for, uh, for us to uh, be better at leading people to faith and making disciples and, and seeing uh, the, the 95% of our population who are not uh, Christians uh, coming to faith in greater numbers and following Christ and seeing culture changed as a result. So let me pray for you, Peter, as we close. Thank you. Uh, and and uh, ask God's blessing, uh, protection, guidance on you as you lead this in Europe. Father, we thank you that uh, you've put Peter into big life and into Sheffield and the Yorkshire Baptist Association at this time, uh, that uh, you're, you're already working in many churches in the YBA. We thank you for the, uh, uh, the people who are already coming to faith. Thank you for those um, families in Sheffield uh mums and and uh, indian students uh, and the people that you've just led to to, to peter and, uh, and his wife and and the uh, uh the way that can impact across the world it's mm. exciting to see god and i just sense that the others of us as we're watching this will sense that that spark of interest lord will you cause that to happen not just for us but in many other parts of the uk and will you peter's ministry grow an openness to to this way of uh learning about uh, being a disciple and making disciples and god may you bless and prosper the ministry of peter and the prosper and bless the ministry of big life for the sake of your kingdom in the name of jesus we pray amen amen thank you very amen. much pleasure thank you very much peter